little bit to see. All right, we are recording now. Excellent. We're going to wait a little bit to see and let the attendees side populate um, before I formally start the meeting. Are you expecting Shelly? Oh, she oh here she is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right on cue. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, Shalini. Hello. Hello. Happy Diwali. Yes, I, I just saw your Facebook post. So, Shalini, you're creating a lot of feedback. Is that better? Let's see. Is that? Yes, that is. Okay. Okay. And oh, we're not quite stable on the attendee side yet. So, we're going to wait just a little bit longer. Okay, it looks like we've stabilized on the attendee side. So um, seeing, a, seeing a presence of a quorum, it is now 7.02 p.m. and I am calling this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order on October 24th, 2022. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapters 22, um, and another one, 107, I think it is, of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to take um, a roll call to make sure everyone can be heard and we can hear everyone. Um, we'll start with Pam. Here. And Mandy is here. Jennifer? Here. Mich um, Pat? Present. Jalani? Present. And we welcome Michelle Miller. Can you hear us? Present. Um, and Rob Mora, thank you for joining us, Rob. And Dave Zomek is also here to answer any questions that people may have while we go through this. So the point of this meeting is a community forum. So you will notice that the agenda only includes the community forum. Um, and it doesn't include public comment because the community forum is public comment. Um, so that's that's what we'll be doing this whole meeting. Um, right now, just so people know, we have about 32 people in the audience. Um, so that is wonderful. And how we'll be running this is I'm going to put up a couple of slides and we're going to go through those slides one by one. Um, the packet included a brief summary or of or a compare contrast of the current bylaw with where we are with the draft bylaw. We'll talk a little bit about that and then for each slide we'll accept public comment, questions and comments. They can all be done at the same time. Um, for that slide and those particular sections of the bylaw. Um, we are hoping with this community forum to get feedback on the bylaw draft itself, anything that concerns people, anything that people really like, um, people things that people don't like, it can go really specific, it can go really general. Um, you know, down to this part of the bylaw, this definition just doesn't work for me, or, you know, I really just love the inspections, part, you know, um, it can be as general or specific as you want, but but feedback that would help us as we continue to draft and revise draft a revision to this bylaw. Um, I want people to know that this is not a bylaw that is set in stone right now, just because it looks like it's a near complete draft revision. We are still very much in the conversation stage, which is why we're doing these forums. Um, we are constantly reviewing the language, constantly talking about the pros and cons of each of the sections, how that will affect um, the various um, constituencies as we go through it, and hearing your feedback and making revisions based on that. So please don't say it's too late for the comments. We're still making changes. Uh, nothing is really set in stone at this point. Um, and in fact, You'll have seen that there's a set of regulations in the packet. Those regulations haven't even been discussed by CRC. So they're there because they're basically a catch-all of things that we thought should be in regulations, at least topic-wise, and then thoughts from committee members as to what that might look like, what they would put in there and all. We haven't even gotten to that yet. So um, we're, we're looking for feedback on that too, but please know that 
it's there but hasn't even been discussed, which is why it's still in very much a draft stage. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to see if any of the other committee members would like to say anything before we move to our first sort of slide um, and, and, you know, public comment. So Shalini. This is actually not about the bylaw and this meeting, but it is India's biggest uh, and South Asian biggest festival. So if there are any people who are here today celebrating Diwali, I just wanted to wish everyone a happy Diwali and let everyone know that there will be a formal celebration on November 5th at the Unitarian Church from 3.30 to 6. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for that announcement, Shalini. Seeing no other hands from my fellow committee members. Oh, Pam. Hi. I thought it would be just a very quick um, and very helpful thing to just remind folks of the goals that we set forward as we started to work on this project. And in, in a nutshell, it is to ensure that rental homes are properly maintained and code compliant so that they are safe and healthy. And that we have an equitable fee structure, that we have a clear licensing program and process so it's easy for people to get through a permit process and obtain a permit, um, that we safeguard strong neighborhoods, and that we also, if we can, address uh, climate action goals. So that's the intent and purpose of, of reworking the, the bylaws. So thank you. Thank you for that nice reminder, Pam, of those goals. <laughs> that, was, that was very helpful. Um, with that, I'm going to move to our, did you just raise your hand again, Pam? Okay. Um, I'm gonna, oh, Athena, can you give me the ability to screen share? There you go. Thank you. I'm going to show on the screen the um, the first um, slide, and then I'll talk about it. We'll take it down. Um, we can always put it back up if people would like to reference it during comments and all. But I, I think we'd rather maybe not stare at it. But I'm I'm happy to leave it up. But this is sort of the first set of summaries of what our current bylaw has versus what the working draft has and some of those changes um, currently in there. Um, in the red, between the time this working draft went out to the public in all of the packets for the second half of October, CRC has had a meeting. And in that time, we did some, discussed some things and, and made some potential changes. No new draft has been issued, but the red indicates some of that change that might not have been in the draft that you're seeing that that will look different in any future draft based on recent CRC discussions. So what the current what what these four sections are is that you know the current bylaw and the working draft will require a permit. Um, the difference between the working draft and the current bylaw based on the most recent discussions is and I didn't fix all of this as I as I look at it now is that the current working draft requires a permit before operating or renting um, a premises, um, a dwelling unit. It, the current bylaw, you have to obtain the permit before renting or offering to rent. So we've removed tentatively that offer to rent requirement in the new draft, although in the draft in your packet, it still has it in there. That's a most recent change. Um, and we've added a requirement that if you're exempt from obtaining the permit, um, that you must submit your documentation to sort of show proof of that exemption. Um, the exemptions remain basically the same, which is lodging, lodg lodging houses, halfway houses, group homes. We have added into it dorms owned and operated by higher educational institutions. And um, so that has been an addition in it. And then also an addition to clarify that properties rented less than 14 total days in a year um, would be exempt from this. But if you rent a property for more than 14 days a year, you would need to obtain a permit. Um, and that clarifies something that is not quite clear in our current bylaw. The issuance and denial section is a lot more specific. 
Um, and it, it, right now it just says permits shall be issued if you complete an application and the current working draft is that permits may be issued if certain requirements are met and that a permit can be denied for specific reasons, that there is the potential for a conditional permit for properties that might not have a passing inspection but are working towards passing an inspection. And it also um, changes that if you need to transfer your permit upon a change of ownership, that that will require a new inspection upon change of ownership. And then the final one on this slide is the consent and other requirements. And this is where the current bylaw um, has that the lease is required to have tenants agree to reasonable access, the owner is required to make leases available, and the owner has to provide some information, an information sheet to all tenants. The current working draft has much of that same language in it, um, including the um, reasonable access language, um, consenting to inspections by owners and all of that. But there are a lot of changes. Those changes will be discussed at Thursday's meeting because we are still working on receiving legal opinions on whether some of this is legal or not, but some of that is in there. Um, and all. And so at this point, I would ask that if you'd like to make comments or have questions about these four sections, permits, um, issuance or denying of permits, the exemptions for obtaining a permit, and then these consent and other requirements, if you would raise your hand. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share. If any commenter would like the screen share back on, I can do that while they are making the comment if they request. Um, but it'll make it easier for me to run to see who to call on <laughs> if I don't have my screen also shared. So at this time, if you'd like to make any comments on those four sections I just summarized or have any questions, please raise your hand. Each person will be allowed three minutes to speak. I'm going to try and recognize all new individuals that wish to speak before I re-recognize someone who has already spoken um, for anything. And, and we'll see how it goes from there. Um, and so at this time, um, Jasna Reggae, um, please unmute yourself, state your name and make your comment or ask your question. Hello, um, I'm Josna Reggae and I live on 96 Farview Way. And thank you, Shalini, for saying happy Diwali, happy Diwali to you too. Um, I'm just um, wanting to know whether there's anywhere in this section or later on where it will make a distinction in the permitting process between owner occupied properties or what do they call them owner adjacent where somebody lives next door or opposite versus sort of corporate owners who live out of town. Will there be a different fee schedule or a different inspection schedule. Um, I feel that that we should be friendlier to owner occupied and owner adjacent, and we should be more, we should be very strict with people who are absentee or uh, corporate entities. So I just wondered whether that's should it should be in this section or if there's anywhere else where that will be addressed. And, and just to add that our neighborhood is a very much a changing neighborhood right on the edge of the northern edge of UMass. And so this is a very real issue for us. We're nearly, you know, we're nearly at a tipping point and we really would like to do everything we can within equitable, you know, the law and being equitable to, to try to maintain a healthy balance in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions, Jasna. Um, I'll do my best. There is not, there's, I think, let me think about this. One distinction in the current bylaw draft regarding sort of owner occupied, owner adjacent, and what some people refer to as absentee or corporate, which is the requirement for a, um, a person in charge if the owner does not live within, I think we just recently changed it to within the tri-county area, Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties, they would have to appoint a person in charge that is within those areas. Um, that is the only distinction I believe that is in the current draft bylaw. Um, we are currently working on the draft um, fee structure and schedule, and that is currently up in the air as to whether that will have any 
distinction between any type of owner occupied and owner adjacent um, type fees and non-owner occupied fees. We've just begun talking about how we could structure a fee schedule um, to make it more equitable. And so that is probably the most likely place to see any distinction, I would say at this point, but I offer up any of the other CRC members or Michelle, if they would like to add any comments in response to that question, Jennifer. Sorry, um, I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of reiterate that we certainly wanted, um, I think we agree that we want to do everything we can to encourage owner occupancy, you know, and nothing to discourage that because, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, in, we just tend to, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of noise and nuisance complaints, they're almost never to owner occupied, um, you know, dwellings, and that's something we'd certainly like to uh, encourage and, and do nothing to discourage in revising the bylaw. Thank you. Um, Shalini. Um, you know, in, term, in terms of the survey responses that we got, uh, we also saw that that was uh, a very predominant theme that uh, tenants who lived in owner occupied homes where they had very good relationships with their landlords and uh, the landlords were very, you know, so th that was a mutually respectful relationship. And as Jennifer pointed that those properties seem to not have many problems associated with that. So we will definitely be looking, you know, we will be sharing the full report, a summary of the survey results. We got more than 250 responses in that. So there will be a summary that will be shared and we will be drawing from that to inform our discussion. Thank you, Shalini. Um, next up is Daniel Rafael Sagalin. Please unmute yourself, state your name, um, where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, I'm sorry, it's taking me a long time to unmute myself. Uh, hi, my name is Dan Segalin. My family has a house in Amherst on Lincoln Avenue. And I wanted to ask, what do the, the proposed draft rules, or regulations, whatever you call them, what are you saying about inspection? I wasn't quite sure what the plan is or the, new, the proposed changes with respect to inspections. Thank you for that question. Um, we'll actually hit that on the next um, slide, but in brief, the inspections are moving from, uh, right now the inspection requirement is a self-certification by the property owners that all of the requirements of state law and code are met. And we are moving towards an inspection requirement. That the inspections would be done by the town. We'll get into a little more detail on that um, in the next slide after we've gotten through these questions on these first four sections. Um, so feel free if it's still, if you've got any other questions at that time, to bring them back up, but that's the main move right now. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Tancredi, please unmute yourself, state your name where you live and make your comment. Uh, yes, hello, I live at um, 57 High Street in Amherst uh, and I have a couple of apartments and a house in my backyard. And, uh, you know, in just hearing the first couple of questions, uh, a couple of things come to mind. Well, first off, after this meeting is over, is there any way that we can go back and hear all this and see all this? Or is that possible in case we, in case we have to leave? Yeah, yes. okay, good. Yeah, okay. So my thinking is owner occupied shouldn't have to pay any fees. I think the big, you know, you know, the 100, 200 unit, apartments and any unoccupied rental houses and things like that, they should bear the burden of everything. Owner occupied is no burden on the town. As you said, we take care of our tenants, we have good relations, we keep up our property, we never call the police. I mean, it seems ridiculous to even throw us into the same category. Uh, it's a totally different animal. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, I think I pay $100 a year uh, to get a, a rental uh, permit or something for my two apartments. And some big uh, complex that has 100 units also pays $100 a year. You know, give me a break. 
<laughs> I, again, I, I know you guys are working hard and, and, and looking at all of this stuff, but owner occupied is a separate animal that should not pay any fees. It, sh it should be the last uh, units that are inspected. It, you know, we deserve the, you know, we're here. We live in town. We are members of the community. None of these other places are. Uh, every, every break or in the world should be uh, made available to us. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob, for your comments. Um, John Farner, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment or ask your question. You just muted yourself again, John. John Varner, Jeffrey Lane. Uh, I have several questions, but I think the overriding thing that I would like to get to is, um, it seems like a lot of the revisions that are being discussed are gonna require uh, increased enforcement and increased tracking and bookkeeping. And um, I definitely encourage those things, but I'm just concerned that the town manager is going to turn around and say, well, we don't really have the budget for that. We can't do that now. And how is the funding for these uh, increased levels of enforcement and inspection and record keeping in the town, uh, how's that going to be funded? Thank you for that question. Um, right now, we have just begun discussing the fee schedule. The goal of the committee so far is to try and create a fee schedule that would self-fund the bylaw um, reg and regulations that go along with the bylaw, the permitting system, including the inspection requirement that will be added um, by the town, which is why we have just I, we can't say much more than that because we've just started discussing that and we have no idea right now what any schedule might look like and what fees and levels of charges would be along that to make that um funding decision but it is it is that is the the start of where crc is starting with the goals of funding um do you have any follow-up with that john or any other questions uh, not with regard to the um, the funding. I, I understand that it's a pretty early stage to have that all figured out. Um, I do have more specific questions. Um, one of them is regarding the, um, is there any provision to have landlords state the nature of the occupancy of their dwellings? Uh, because how are you going to track where four unrelated individuals are living uh, unless you have landlords come forth and say, well, this is an unrelated group of individuals, this is a group of students, this is a family, you know, ca categorize the rentals in some way that uh, will identify uh, student housing. So right now the bylaw has two provisions for doing that for two specific um, like groups of people maybe, groups of residents. The bylaw requests in the application, the bylaw says that the application needs to ask and the um, property owners would need to identify how many units on their property are being occupied by section eight um, holders. Um, and also how many units are being on that property are being occupied by um, that, that qualify as student rentals. And that is a specific definition in the bylaw right now in terms of what we have defined as a student rental in the bylaw. So those are the only two sort of sets of areas in terms of nature of occupancy that right now the bylaw is attempting to differentiate and identify um, within the rental units and dwelling units on any particular permit. Uh, thanks. That uh, answers that question. And uh, I think I can hold off on asking any more right now. I don't want to occupy too much time here. Thank you, John. Um, next is Narayan Sampath. Please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment or ask your question. Great. Thank you. My name is Narayan. I live in Kendrick Place, and I have a owner-occupied rental, so it's two units. And I just want to follow up on the gentleman before this who spoke about 
fees on owner-occupied rental, and <clears throat> also, um, I'll wait for more information about inspections, but I think the committee should also consider that, you know, the fees that you add on to us, we eventually would pass on to the landlord, right? And the, the, the fees at the $150 is not that big of a deal, but, you know, when there's an inspection in and things come up and we'll take care of it, but at the end of the day, we also would need to consider whether we're gonna pass it on to the uh, tenants that we have or not. So it's just a comment. Thank you for that comment, Narayan. Ira Brick, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live and make your, question, your comment or ask your question. Hi, I'm Ira Brick. I live at 255 Strong Street. And just to build on what the last couple of suggestions, I had written a letter today that I hope you will all read that makes several points. But um, I agree that if you have any kind of user tax on landlords, that they're going to pass that on to tenants. And I would suggest that the proper party to pay this would be UMass to increase their pilot, their payment in lieu of taxes, by the actual cost of what it would take for the town to hire the inspectors. So instead of turning this into a profit center where the town actually might make money on something like this to not make money on this, but to just have UMass pay the salaries and benefits and whatever else it is. And I think that because UMass is actually the root cause of this student uh, housing problem, um, that they should pay the true cost of the situation that they're helping to create. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Ira. I'm not seeing any hands specifically to this right now. This is not our only public comment. I, I'm going to move on to the next um, set of changes, which are inspections and other permit requirements. And the current bylaw, as I mentioned earlier, has a self-inspection certification, a self-certification of inspections. And the property owners need to do that annually for all properties, and they have to do it as part of the application requirements. Um, subsidized housing is fully exempt from this inspection requirement. And there are some other exemptions, including long-term tenants, occasional rentals, um, and all. The current working draft of the bylaw is to move inspections into an actual inspection by town officials. Um, and that those inspections, any deficiencies found in those inspections would need to be corrected before a permit issues. Although I did talk about that contingency um, type permit while inspections are going on and fixes are being made. The inspections would no longer be tied to the application. The regulations would determine frequency, um, but the bylaw itself sets forth a little bit about that frequency, including that the expected cycle would be every three years. So a permit applied for, if there was an inspection that was passed within three years of that application, no new inspection would be needed. It could lengthen potentially up to five years uh, under regulation. The regulations right now are a draft that the thinking of CRC when we were discussing these lengths was if there aren't um, violations that that could lengthen to five years. Um, or it can shorten on the other end to one year cycles per the regulations, or if there are a certain number of violations within a permit year. The long term tenants would also have an extended cycle um, from three years in the current bylaw to five years in the draft bylaw that we're looking at. Um, subsidized housing would no longer be automatically exempt from inspections, but they could be exempted from inspections upon the um, discretion of the building commissioner. Um, and occasional rentals would be exempt for the first year of the permit, but if that occasional rental turned into a rental for a second year, they'd need to get that inspection on the second year. Um, and then not every dwelling unit would be inspected um, on the larger properties. It would bottom out at about 25% of the units um, to be inspected. So the other permit requirements in the current bylaw there's an occupancy limits are mentioned but it's unclear whether it's a requirement of the bylaw and there's a parking plan requirement in the working draft bylaw there are a, a mention of energy efficiency standards um, the occupancy limits would be required to be met um, law and regulation compliance is required a parking plan um, clear requirements for obtaining a permit so the parking plan remains in there um, as to the energy efficiency standards, 
CRC recently received the request um, and the updates from ECAC on what they would be seeking. And the efficiency standards at this point, what they're asking CRC to put into the regulations are a required energy audit for properties that have one to four units. Um, and that's the ever source um, sort of ma the mass save energy audit. Um, and if you have five or more units on your property, an EPA portfolio manager aggregated energy use um, reporting system is what ECAC has asked CRC to put in the draft regulations. They're not in the current draft because we received that after this draft went online. Um, so those are the changes in those two sections. This is the inspections and other permits. I'm going to stop sharing at this time. If you've got any comments or questions related to these two items, we're going to get to violations and um, penalties in the next slide. Um, but Pam, comments from you first. Sure. I just wanted to point out that parking requirements and occupancy limits are in our zoning bylaws. So they are clearly in place within our current laws. Um, and the question would be if we want to repeat that in a, in a rental permitting bylaw or point to existing uh, requirements. So that's been a good conversation. Uh, it's clear that we need occupancy limits and we need parking requirements how they are um, handled in this draft is TBD. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add in the current bylaw, it does reference the zoning bylaw. So it speaks to it that way. It says that what's in the zoning bylaw will be complied with by the rental bylaw. Yeah. Thank you. So at this time, if you've got questions or comments on the inspections, the proposed at this point, working changes to the inspections or the other permit requirements, please raise your hand um, and, and I will recognize you each in turn. We're gonna start with Narayan. Sampa, please unmute yourself and make your comment. Great, thank you again. Um, regarding the mass save or the ECAC inspection, um, would the committee consider well, let's say I just had an inspection done and I did what I could afford to do, but what if there are suggestions that are relatively expensive that need to be done, which I would love to do, but I really can't. And I'm sure I speak for other landlords, like I would love to have solar panels in my roof, but not right now. So what would the committee take into account as to, okay, you've got the mass save audit done and you have these five recommendations, what needs to be implemented and what is a recommendation that could be implemented later? Is that something that the committee would consider? Thank you. No, thank you for that question. So right now, all ECAC is asking CRC to put in the regulations is that the mass save inspection be required or energy audit be required to be done. Um, not that anything found in that audit need to be done, but just that the audit be completed. And and ECAC recommended, I believe it was a three-year timeline to be able to complete that audit. So they they had suggested a time frame of until J July of 2026, I believe. Um, again, we just got those recommendations. We haven't been able to put them in writing yet and discuss in detail what we would do with them, but it was only a recommendation to mandate the audit not to mandate anything recommended by the audit to be completed. Um, do you have thank any follow-up questions? No, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, with that, Daniel Raphael Sagalin, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. It's taking me forever to unmute myself. Um, I think the inspections is a good idea. It's all in implementation and how long it takes to wait to get an inspection. Do we have any idea on how this would actually work in practice? Um, not completely, um, but what I will say is the bylaw has foreseen that it would take at least three years or the goal is to have all of the rental properties. We now currently have a little over 1100 rental permits issued. So that's 1100 parcels with rental permits on them. And we have at this point 
said three years to get all of the initial inspections by the town inspectors done. That may change um, as we actually start discussing those numbers and figuring out whether that's even a reasonable number or not. Um, but it is not an expectation that if the council passes this change, that within two months, all 1100 would be inspected by the town. Um, we know it will take time. Um, the bylaw um, plans on the building commissioner or the principal code enforcement official making a schedule of how to get those inspections done within that amount of time. And so it gives some discretion to that person to determine which ones to start with, which ones to leave till year three, or if we extend to year four or five that long. Um, so we don't have a plan right now on how, but we do know it will take years. Right, uh, assuming if you do go forward with that, you'd have very clear information available for what are all the things that have to be up to code? It The bylaw uh, does say that there would be a checklist created um, that would be used to determine the things that are being checked. But again, we haven't gotten that far as to what would be on that checklist because um, that's foreseen to be in the regulations and we haven't discussed the regulations yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Ira, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Ira Brick, still at 255 Strong Street. I would like to suggest that an educational video would be helpful. Um, the video could be aimed at both uh, landlords and tenants at the same time and just show what an inspection is going to look like what are the kinds of things that student tenants might realize are problems and how they can complain about it. And also um, just setting a standard for landlords to know, and it could include some, you know, local expertise from uh, Rob Mora and people like that about how you're protecting your investment by keeping things up to shape and not deferring maintenance. And I think probably there's people at UMass film department that could make this and it could go viral and it could increase the reputation of UMass and Amherst of this is how we clarify things that need to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment and suggestion, Ira. Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, Renata Shepard of Justice Drive. Um, I have a question regarding the um, mass save inspections. They're great, love them. I've uh, done even through field assistance. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, for example, renting a, a unit in a condo association. Sometimes uh, we run into the issue of mass saving doing the whole property. So not necessarily you'll be able to do one unit like your own unit because they normally go by the whole property. So just, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of leeway in terms of what is done via mass save and condo associations. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Renata. Um, John Varner, please unmute yourself and state your, or make your comment or ask your question. John Varner, 54 Jeffrey Lane. Uh, I was just uh, remembering a meeting that was uh, a Zoom meeting that was held in late August, I believe, with John Thompson and the building inspector. I am not sure the man's name, I can't recall it. But they were talking about um, going to apartments and seeing violations and then going back in a month to see if the violations have been corrected and they hadn't been. And I was wondering why landlord wasn't being assessed at least $100 a day I see in the new proposal, it's going up to $300 per day per violation, which is the state limit on uh, those things. But I, I was curious to know um, if there was some reason that the, the landlord involved hadn't been issued um, a fine uh, commensurate with the offense. I mean, if it's happening one day and it's happening another day a month later, I think it's safe to assume that it's been ongoing for a month and, and the the person should be assessed a fine for every day of the violation. I don't know that that's really happening 
And I was curious, I mean, that would really bring in some money to help um, uh, counterbalance the expense of uh, tracking and, and uh, prosecuting these things. Thank you for the question, John. I'm gonna to go to Rob Mora, who's our building commissioner, to see if he can talk a little bit about how his department decides when and how often and how much to assess fines and non-criminal fees on things like this. Hi, uh, Rob Mora, building commissioner. So yeah, we do you know, face that quite often and you know, have to make a decision whether or not we're going to uh, assess the penalty under non-criminal disposition. When we're looking at uh, health, safety, building, and fire regulations, we tend to cite those codes rather than the rental registration bylaw, which is the one that gives us the non-criminal disposition. So we start with our codes and regulations that are enforceable through the courts, uh, not necessarily through fines, uh, although there are some exceptions to that uh, through the fire regulations. And you know, if we're unable to get compliance that we're satisfied with, then we can cite violations of the uh, rental permit, uh, rental uh, regulations, and and look at ticketing under the non-criminal disposition uh, section. We tend to use that more often for zoning violations. Uh, so parking, uh, you know, there I saw two today where uh, John Thompson wrote to the to the, uh, the the owner of the property and said, you know, bring us into compliance, otherwise you're going to face fines. And you know, that's kind of the last uh, warning before that will happen. Uh, we also have a lot of experience with um, uh, uh, su supporting those fines and, and arguing for those fines in district court. So we have a pretty good handle on what we think the, uh, the court will support us uh, with on the types of, of fines. And as you probably can imagine, oftentimes they're, they've been dismissed or significantly reduced uh, by the magistrate and district court. So uh, we're, we're not too loose in writing the fines unless we feel like we're unable to get uh, uh, compliance and a response from the, the property owner for the situation. Thank you for that explanation, Rob. John, do you have any follow-up on that? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Thank you, John. Tom Crossman, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, um, and make your comment or ask your question. Uh, good evening, uh, Tom Crossman, Amherst native. Um, Want to express my gratitude for everybody putting forth an effort to make a safer, healthier, um, better neighborhoods for Amherst. Um, just my comment or question would be related to occupancy limits and taking into consideration what is still um, a safe and healthy um, environment, but um, is being underutilized. In example, a property that may be 6,200 square feet, but is a single family home that has seven bedrooms um, built within compliance of the, the laws of the land, but can only rent to four people. And meanwhile, there's um, um, uh, rumors that there are people put up in hotels right now because they can't find housing. So I'm trying to think about our housing stock and our inventory and if there's going to be any flexibility in granting more opportunity for people to find uh, safe and adequate housing in our community. So just taking into consideration occupancy limits and if there is any way to consider um, adjusting that rule so that we can use the shelter that we have in, a, in our existing stock to provide health, uh, housing for people who are interested in living in our community. Thank you for that comment, Tom. Um, I do wanna say that the occupancy limits as Pam Rooney has said are part of our zoning bylaw and the rental permitting bylaw, just as an information for everyone who's attending, um, is not in the zoning bylaw. It's not dealing with changes to the zoning bylaw. Occupancy limits are listed, I believe four times in the zoning bylaw in terms of unrelated individuals. Um, two in the definitions, one under non-owner occupied duplexes and one under the accessory dwelling units. Um, what the zone, what the permitting bylaw is dealing with and what CRC is discussing as it relates to the permitting bylaw is how do those occupancy limits and those zoning bylaws get reflected as Pam mentioned earlier into what constitutes a violation and then how do you treat that violation. And so while we as CRC have had 
lots of discussions on that number, and I'm sure we will continue to have lots of discussions on that number. Um, that number won't change as it relates to the permitting bylaw, because the permitting bylaw is not dealing with anything related to changes to the zoning bylaw. Um, the permitting bylaw is a general bylaw, um, but it is certainly something we will be discussing and have heard a lot of. Uh, Jennifer. Yes, I also wanted to say that in, uh, you know, one always can rent to families and there's no limit on the size. So, you know, if you have a big, large older house, you know, that's, there's families that would, you know, lots of families that would love to rent houses in Amherst. So that's, there, there's no, you know, clearly there's no cap on that in terms of occupants. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Pat. Just a quick reaction to what Jennifer just said. I think we need to look at what the definition of family is, uh, whether it's uh, a man and a wife or two women or two men and their children, grandparents, cousins, whatever. It, well, our families are diverse, um, and I think they need to look be looked at individually, not lumped together with students, or students create families as well. Thank you, Pat. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I um, also want to add, you are, um, the zoning bylaw is pretty, is expansive on how it defines families, so that um, they were you know, maybe that needs to be revised, but they were, that was mindful when that was crafted in the zoning bylaw. Thank you. And if anyone is curious, that definition is found in article 12 of the zoning bylaw under the word family. Um, and then in parentheses, I think it says household. Um, with that, um, Tom, did you have any other comments before I move on to the next hand? I appreciate your response. Thank you. Um, the next hand is, um, is Daniel Raphael Sagalin. So please unmute yourself, state your name. We know your name um, and make your comment or ask your question. So just a quick question back to following up on Tom's question about four unrelated people. Isn't that a Massachusetts a state of Massachusetts law or regulation or rule, not just an Amherst bylaw or zoning issue? Um, I'm gonna move to Rob to see if he knows the answer to that question. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a local zoning bylaw and you can you'll see that vary from town to town throughout the commonwealth so it's not it's not a state or general law thank you rob okay thanks janet mcgowan please unmute yourself state your name where you live and make your comment or ask your question um i'm janet mcgowan i live at 706 south east street I just wanted to briefly talk about that occupancy limit. I grew up in Stony Brook on Long Island, which is um, used to be a small teacher's college and is now one of the largest you know, universities in um, the SUNY system. And the, the um, town of Beltaire nearby put in an occupancy limit of four unrelated individuals. Um, and that went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld that. And I, I just wanna, you know, there's a lot of good reasons for that in terms of when you grow up in a student town to um, limit the number of students living next door or how many students are living next door. There's a lot of complaints in Amherst about there, you know, there's six or eight. I know of one house that had eight students in a small ranch. Um, you know, if your occupancy limit is four and people are violating it to six, but what happens when your occupancy limit is seven or eight and then there's 10 or 15 people there? And so, um, it's legal, it's constitutional. I grew up in a, in a college town and, you know, I keep on hearing about this house on, I think it's on, you know, North Pleasant Street or East Pleasant Street. You know, if you have a 6,200 square foot house and you want to rent it, you could always break it into two or three units and make even more money. But at least each unit would be, you know, four people or less or a family of, um, you know, related people in some way. And I just think there's there's always going to be some exemption, exception to the rule, but you just need a rule that really takes care and does achieves like the best for the town. Um, and we should just sort of think about that and not just think, oh, this is a big house and we can only have four people in it. I know from being on a Facebook page for UMass off-campus housing, there are many, many apartments where there are more than four students. People are living in living rooms, um, you know, sharing bedrooms. 
Um, and so I just think we should keep in mind, like we're trying to do the greater good, keep a town where we can have a mix of people in every neighborhood, calm, nice neighborhoods that are inviting and not kind of overrun by rowdy behavior. And so I think, you know, I just think, you know, there's always an exception or you're thinking, oh, that's a tragedy for somebody who has this giant house, but they could always convert it to a dwelling, you know, three dwelling units under our current zoning and make money. Thank you for your comment, Janet. Um, Jennifer, you wanted to make a comment or well, respond? Just that in a owner occupied home, if you have a large home, there's no limit on how many um, tenants you can rent to. So if you're living in a home that has five bedrooms or six bedrooms, you have one, you could rent to five. So they're, they just wanted to you know, remind that if that wasn't clear. Shalini. Could we have uh, Rob Murray comment on that? He had shared in the last meeting that in one case, the recent case where um, lawyers were hired and it was not upheld by the court because there was no health or safety concern. Rob, would you like to re-summarize? Um, I think you did that for our working session last week. Could you Could you do that summary again? Yeah, it's it's actually a case that's not resolved yet, um, and it's not that the court the court hasn't made a decision on it yet. <clears throat> I'm not sure if there will be a decision from the court, but um, I, the point I think I was trying to make is that when we were at the hearing in uh, housing court, the question that came back to us was, is there a health and safety uh, violation and you know it made us feel like well if we had a health and safety violation it would be looked at much differently than it's being looked at and it was continued off until a date in november uh mid-november uh so i think it wasn't uh you know being seen as as urgent as we uh would would have liked it to have been seen uh but that was that is a case that has um more occupants in the house than four and we've uh, gathered enough evidence to to uh, build a case and and um, uh, use that to gain compliance. Uh, but what we're up against are the eviction laws uh, and procedures. So uh, you know, uh, best case an eviction you know can be handled with within two to three months if it's perfect. Uh, so we're finding out that we're looking at other ways to try to bring the property into compliance by getting the owners and the individuals involved to um, you know, participate in that discussion, but that's not resolved yet, that particular case. But it's not uncommon, I guess it's, a, it's an example of something that's pretty common over the years that we've, we've dealt with. Thank you, Rob. Shalini. Um, I, I think I just want to put it out there that um, the first and foremost thing is the health and safety, right? Um, the second thing that we're hearing a lot from the surveys was the concerns about the when there are excessive students or tenants living, there is parking on the lawns and uh, trash or noise or so those are the concerns that are there when there is uh, when there is a concentration of tenants living in small spaces. On the other hand, if we could, we could uh, look at these these accommodations um, in a different way, where we are taking into account the parking space, the safety and health. And it wasn't about the number; it was more about what can this unit accommodate or this house accommodate, given the neighborhood. We might actually find that some homes should not allow even four, they should allow three. And then some homes should allow six or seven. So it really should not maybe be about, um, it shouldn't be about that. And that's, I mean, that's again, a discussion I think we need to have, and I don't think we've had it yet. So I just wanted the community to know that we are gonna be looking at it in a very detailed way from all angles, from the landlord's angles, from the tenants, from the residents, and then um, you know, see what, what comes up from that. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer, and then I would like to move back to see if the public has comments and all um, to for since it's a public 
community forum. Jennifer, though. Yeah, I just wanted to say, though, that we are not, we aren't just looking at how many tenants, you know, can safely or live or that a square a house of a certain square footage can accommodate X number of occupants and that, but we're also looking at the impact on neighborhoods that I know are very important to many people. So I, I wanted to um, make very clear that we're not just looking at how many people can fit in the house, but what the impact will be, you know, on the surrounding street and neighborhood. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. I don't see any other hands um, in the audience right now. So I'm gonna share my screen again and go to our <laughs> last slide. Um, once I find the right one. And the last slide we have here, and then once, once we open up comments on this slide, it can be this slide and anything else you guys would like to say to us or any other comments you have to us. We don't go into detail in the regulations, but this section, this slide talks about the differences between the current bylaw and the working draft bylaw on complaints and violations. Um, and then also talks a little bit about the regulations. Um, so in the current bylaw, the enforcement options include the fines, include a civil action to compel compliance, enforcement orders, and suspension of a rental permit in instances of egregious violations after efforts to have been made to gain compliance. And the fine, if, if leveled, would be $100 a day an offense. And if a suspension is leveled, it would take effect at the end of the lease, start the first suspension would be 90 days, and then it would be 180 days if a second one needed to be issued, and then it would be three years if a third one needed to be issued. And any appeals of the suspensions would move to a rental appeals board. Um, the working draft bylaw has very many, many of the very similar options, criminal, non-criminal fines, violations and fines, an order to remedy, um, problem, the, the newest one is this problem property designation that we've been talking about. You can suspend, revoke, or deny a permit for failure to correct outstanding violations or for having life safety violations or continuing as a problem property designation as a designation as a problem property. Um, there's a potential requirement as a potential um, penalty or a, after violation to require that the property owner appoint a manager or potentially a different manager and then the possibility of an order to vacate. The fines would be increased to 300 per day per violation. That is the maximum a town can, um, can enforce under state law. No town can go over $300 a day per violation in their fines. Um, the suspension would, again, if it was suspended, would take effect at the at the end of the lease, and it would start instead of at 90 days at six months and then go to a year, and then anything else would be dealt with in regulations. The appeals of suspensions, revocations, and denials would go to the Board of License Commissioners instead of creating a new rental appeals board. Um, the regulations, there really aren't regulations right now based on the current bylaw um, that I'm aware of. And the working draft bylaw provides for regulations and those regulations at this point where the working draft bylaw talks about them are for potentially more application requirements, those energy efficiency requirements we talked about, what a prop, how to designate a property, a problem property and what requirements are there or what violations and how that would happen. Um, and then also the standards for permanent suspension are in there right now. As I said, we have not discussed as a committee the actual language or the actual items that are in that. It's basically been, oh, could we do that in, in regulations? Let's move that language over. We'll talk about it later. Um, and then as people have sent and mentioned things about potential for those sections, they've been added into this document to provide a starting point for conversation. Um, the reason we're looking at regulations and looking at putting a number of these things into that is to provide more flexibility, especially with things like energy efficiency requirements or application requirements. It's easier to amend regulations than it is a bylaw. That means regulations can provide the flexibility to change as necessary um, given change in, changing circumstances, especially around what energy efficiency programs there might be. Um, and so that's what that is um, at this time. Um, if you would like to have any 
comments or questions on the complaint and violation section or on the regulations, please um, raise your hand and um, ask to be recognized. And Athena, um, could you at this point mute Janet so that we don't have the going, um, the, the back and forth um, sort of noise, I guess it is. She was being very quiet, but I could still hear some. <laughs> So I just want to mention, I've been tracking attendees for people, and I think we hit a maximum number of attendees of about 42 at one point during tonight. So far, we're back down to about 34. Um, so if people were wondering, that's sort of where we've been on attendees. So we're going to start with John Varner. Um, John, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. John Varner, uh, Jeffrey Lane. Uh, I was just uh, curious to know if there's any way the town could further the uh, general knowledge of, of land, scoff law landlords, basically, um, in the community by releasing to the media and or the uh, off-campus housing office at UMass, the uh, properties that are in violation with behavior or um, building codes or uh, rental codes, I think it would help both in terms of sort of shaming landlords into behaving more if their deeds were out in public a little more visibly. And it would also help alert renters um, who are looking for properties uh, as to whether or not they want to deal with a landlord who has a, a history of problematic rentals. Thank you for the suggestion. I'm going to go to Rob. I know in the past we have had a system where we could, where the town um, somehow reported or had a website that indicated where noise complaints and violations were had, and also I think code violations. So Rob, could you talk about that? Sure. Um, unfortunately, we lost the capability to display our code enforcement actions on the GIS. So if you're if you're searching for a property on the town mapping system and you use the permits uh, complaints tab, uh, you'll see some old complaints, you'll see old violations uh, and even the progress with code enforcement. And that was our way of trying to, you know, make sure the public was aware of what was, what was going on at the properties, uh, having information about the, uh, the point of contact for a particular property and prospective renters to be able to look at a property and, and see the history of it. Uh, for a reasons I can't explain, but was told by our IT department that we're no longer able to use the system in that way. Um, you know, we've asked IT to um, help us uh, build a program, you know, a, a, another system uh, that will take our, uh, our information like that, our progress and our actions on properties and make sure they're, uh, readily accessible. Uh, so that's, I don't have any other information on it, but I think it's an interesting point uh, and question that Mr. Varner raised and we're also interested in being able to do that in some way. And I think maybe, you know, depending on how the bylaw finishes out, if there's a, a point or grading system to a property that would also be displayed so that a, a, a prospective renter in particular would know, uh, you know, how a property has been performing. Thank you, Rob. Um, John, do you have any follow-up questions or comments on that? Uh, no, not at this time. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, Renata Shepard again, I just described. I have a couple of comments regarding, you know, different things since you said we could comment on different things on the bylaw as well. And um, yes. Let's say, um, you know, I still believe that, you know, 5% of the rents for each unit would be a fair um, rate for, for fees. Uh, rents are generally advertised and reported as income. Uh, but if that doesn't pass, any fees over like 80 or $100 uh, can be a burden for small landlords with one or two properties versus bigger landlords who even having higher overhead costs still charge more for rental. Um, parcel permit 
uh, parcel permits are great because they reduce paperwork, uh, but the fees need to be, you know, fair. Um, I, I would then suggest like a fifty to a hundred dollar for one unit versus like one thousand from ten to twenty units. You know, when you guys had the uh, the tier um, option, you know, two thousand for twenty one to forty units, for example. You know, just a, some ideas in hopes that that um, would look a bit fair and cover program costs, you know, hiring people, et cetera. Um, also regarding uh, renters uh, being the representative, I personally know responsible people who get a rental discount for acting as managers and can therefore afford their rents. And I hope that can continue. I also know properties, one in particular, whose owner and helper used to be in town meeting where um, the rental permit is not even listed. And I know the property was rented uh, that owner certainly receives her tax bill at a different address, but for some reason, the permit is not listed. Um, um, regarding the point system uh, or the you know public reporting of the landlord, if the problem is the property management, not necessarily the owner, uh, please have some kind of provision where the owner can remedy um, this point system efficiently. Property managers are notorious for keeping bad records or, or for bad record keeping and uh, tenant response. And sometimes owners are not immediately aware, especially if they live far away. Like for example, you can say that I moved to you know, the South at some point and have a manager. And I wanna make sure that they're managing properly, but you know, sometimes just get a bad manager. Um, and lastly, um, you know, it's hard to accept when we feel that government is placing a larger burden on small versus larger businesses like LLCs. Um, and having observed this bylaw process has been very educational and I do appreciate, you know, the thought and effort you all are putting into it. Um, you can't please everyone, but at least I feel that, you know, we're being heard and feel that you care. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Renata. Ira Brick, please unmute yourself, make your comment, or ask your question. Hi, Ira Brick. I have a suggestion for this section um, that when you communicate, that there be some kind of preamble that would go to both the tenant and the landlord about the reason for this is to protect the health and safety um, and the quiet enjoyment of your neighbor's uh, properties and also to just make the point that you know if you establish a relationship with your neighbor it can really be much easier than having people feel like they don't know that the, the noisy neighbors next door and have to call the police so you know a lot of these issues of noise anyway um, can be solved just by going and talking as I am about to do with my neighbors tomorrow and um I think that just the same way that in your right column, you have reasons for the changes. If people understand the reasons for rules, they will feel that it's a fairer process and, and go along with it. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Ira. Um, Andrew DeServio, please um, unmute yourself, state your name where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, thanks. Uh, Andrew DeCervo. I live at 10 Northeast Street. Um, I'm referring to what's on page 22 of the draft. We didn't cover it here in depth, but uh, this is referring to the points being assigned for, um, I guess, a problem property. And my larger concern here is that there's a lot of things here that uh, are being done ostensibly by potential tenants, you know, disorderly conduct, drugs and possession with intent to deliver alcohol with minors, sexual assault, aggravated assault. I mean, certainly these are things that we care about, um, but putting this on the, uh, the shoulders of the, you know, the property owner um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, um, you know, ultimately it was like, what, what sort of agency do I have? Um, what do the laws allow me to do? I mean, I can certainly report this to the police if I think the law is being broken. Um, but, you know, I mean, my, my ability to go in there and to put a stop or an end to this behavior it doesn't seem realistic to me so number one I don't know if it's gonna it would ever hold up in court but you know I, I would hope that it would never get that far 
I mean, what, what's your thoughts concerning this? Is this something that you really seriously are considering to add in there? Um, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'll, I'll let the other CRC members also comment after I make this statement. As I said, these are um, the regulations have not been discussed at all by CRC. Um, that set of lists has been transferred directly from, um, basically directly from, I believe, state colleges set of lists for their point system um, as a potential model. Um, which is why it is all in there. But CRC has not had, I don't think we've had a single discussion on whether we would keep any or all of them or none of them at all or make our own list. Um, and so comments related to that will certainly help inform us as we begin those discussions later. But um, that's where that list came from. And I believe it was directly pulled from State College. Uh, Pam. I would uh, appreciate hearing from the former speaker to understand uh, who is in the best position to um, provide some control or management of the tenants and the tenants activities. If, you know, obviously we would like the tenants to be self managing, um, but, but give us some feedback on, on who else is appropriate to, to do some of that work. Thank you. Um, I offer that up to not just Andrew, if he would like to respond, but anyone else in the audience, if they would like to answer that question. Well, I'll step up to the plate for now. Um, I, I think the concern that I have largely is like, I've had tenants that I've had difficulties with. Uh, you know, they lived directly next to me, they were loud. And, you know, my ability to say, you know what, this isn't reasonable behavior, you need to go out there and address these particular issues that I have you with you doesn't necessarily always work in your favor. Um, you know, they are free agents. Uh, they will find, uh, you know, act out in, to the limits of the law, if, it, if you will. Um, I'm being quoted by them. This is past tenants have, happily. Um, where it was just like, yeah, well, you know what? I mean, the sound ordinances say that we can be as loud as we want till nine. It was like, you know, I mean, I, I don't see it that way. Uh, but having said that, really, honestly, I mean, the legal sort of issues here, rape and all the rest, you know, am I able to go into their property without warning? Am I able to go out there and enforce the laws? I mean, this is a, there's a certain point where you need to bring in, you know, law enforcement when it gets to that point. Certainly, I can encourage and cajole. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm completely without agency, but um, these, these, are, these are signing fines to me on behavior that I don't want in my neck, you know, in my property, but I, I, my ability to go out there and affect these things is limited. Thank you for those comments, Andrew. Sure. Um, Reva Novi, please unmute yourself and state your name where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I joined the meeting late. I had a different commitment. Um, you were talking about the energy efficient standards and I read this entire draft, but it didn't enumerate what energy efficient standards um, are going to have to be in place. For instance, the rental property that I own was built in 1974 and we have done several upgrades on the property, a different furnace that's more efficient. We replace the windows, et cetera. But where do I see the list of what's being recommended or is going to be required for energy efficient standards? Thank you for that question. Um, it is it, the draft that went out here um, was incomplete because we didn't have those those standards or what our energy and climate action committee would be asking. We now have what they are asking for. And so I will I will summarize that for you. And the next draft that comes out of for this bylaw and regulations will have that in there. But what our energy and climate action committee has asked us to put in regarding those standards are two things. For units, um, for parcels that have one to four dwelling units, so one to four rentals, they they would recommend that we require a mass save energy audit be completed and that completion date would be approximately within three years of the effective date of the bylaw. There would be no requirement to do anything that is recommended within that mass save audit. So if there was a recommendation to add insulation, you wouldn't have to add the insulation. Just completing the energy audit would be sufficient um, to comply with 
the regulations as ECAC has asked CRC to put in the regulations. For units or parcels that have more than five units, they have asked us to require that an EPA um, energy reporting program, I never remember, remember the exact name, a portfolio manager be completed. And that is a free online system that reports energy use and EUI use and things like that for the buildings that have those beyond that. And again, it would be to just complete that within three years. Um, I can't speak much about what that portfolio manager entails because I have not been in the system and okay. uh, I'm not an ECA member that's looked at it, but but those would be the the two requirements for the quote energy efficiency standards at this time. Um, so it would not have it would not at this time we are not being asked to put in a specific like you have to meet a specific energy use intensity or you have to have a certain rating on your boiler or anything like that. We have not been asked to put that in. We've just been asked to basically require these two reporting mechanisms or things done so that we have an idea of where things stand. Okay. And so that's like calling Eversource and asking Eversource to do their. I have another question. Yes. When I read the draft, one of the requirements or proposed requirements is that there be, um, I, I can't remember the exact wording, there, but it was a, like a safety lock, like the kind that's either on a hotel door or a chain so that you can open the door only a few inches instead of actually opening it for somebody. And um, where I used to live, we this was discussed with the fire marshal and the fire marshal the, said that you should not have those because in case of an actual fire, if you have that lock on in that panic state that a person's in trying to get out of their place, they're pulling and pulling on the door and it's not registering why the door isn't opening. So um, my suggestion would be, yes, you should definitely have peepholes and they should be at a level that your tenants can look out, possibly two, one for a child or someone who's in a wheelchair and one for a standard adult, but to not have um, that kind of chain. Um, so that that's an opinion. <laughs> I would not like to put that on my rental. Thank you for that comment. Um, what I will say to you and to others is those comments are very helpful. We have that list too. I believe that that what you saw there was part of a potential inspection checklist, things that an inspector might go and look. And again, a lot of ideas went into that and CRC has not discussed what may or may not remain. So any comments we receive about what concerns people are helpful as we start those discussions in the coming weeks. Thank you. Dorothy Pam, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment or ask your question. Um, the thing about controlling uh, people who live next door, whether it's your responsibility or not, I mean, the, the, the charge, um, having a rowdy house uh, is a very old one, maybe from the 18th, 19th century. So people are responsible for what goes on in a property they own. Um, but I could say that it's really easier to deal with than you might think. Uh, the house next to me student has many students in it, and it was very wild the first year we lived here. Um, it, there's been no problem for a number of years. Uh, obviously, the people who manage the house um, decided to spend a little more time choosing their tenants. Maybe they're older, maybe they're graduate students, I don't know. But whatever it is, they're responsible young adults, and they're not, they don't cause me any problem at all. So I think the one has to think about who you're renting to, uh, because uh, a disorderly house is something that is the responsibility of, of the landowner. And, and nobody really wants to live next to one. And I'm, you know, whether you own it or not. So I, I do feel also that's a good reason for keeping the number of students, unrelated students, uh, two, four, so you don't get outnumbered. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Dorothy. Um, at this time, I'm going to open up the floor to anyone in the attendees who would like to make any additional comments on what has been proposed, what you saw, or any other thoughts you have as CRC moves to continuing to come up with 
and can discuss this draft bylaw, but also as we move into discussing the draft regulations too. Um, so essentially the floor is open for any additional comments. It doesn't have to be related to anything, any specific part of what we've talked about today. You can go back to permit issuance if you want, for example. Um, John Varner. Uh, I'm still, um still wondering about the funding for an increased uh, data management system for the town. Uh, a lot of the things that are being proposed require uh, sort of an ongoing um, database that will cost money to construct and maintain. And things like the property map where you could actually go and see where rowdy houses were being located. Um, or zoning complaints of different sorts were being uh, located. I mean, that, that seems like a pretty essential part of keeping track of what's going on in a town going forward so that we can deal with all these things as they come up. I think part of the problem we're having now is a result of the town not having very good records about student housing conversions and um, the rental problems that are popping up now have a long history of building in a town. And I think part of it's because data hasn't been tracked for these things. Uh, what is the, I, I don't understand town government well enough to figure out where the money is gonna come from for an increased database. Uh, is that something that town council votes on? Is that something that comes out of the manager's um, budget proposal? And how do people in the town sort of push to get that real fundamental foundational block to this whole change process uh, in place? I'll try my best to answer that one. Um, so I think what you're asking is when Rob talked about the IT seeking an IT, a new way for IT to for the town to be able to log those noise nuisance bylaws beyond the GIS system that it used to log in, how would that get funded in the current budget or with this, right? Um, and so that would come potentially from funding from um, within the IT operating budget, depending on how expensive that is and whether that is required, say, a new, um, a new application or software package or something. It might come out of the capital budget, um, which is something that might last for more than five years and costs more than $5,000 is, is how we do capital. And so we have funded um, in the past, the town has funded um, software improvements and stuff like that through the capital budget. So it could be potentially a capital budget line item. It could potentially come out of the IT budget itself. Um, in terms of what we're working on now, we're also, as I said before, we're looking at finding a fee structure that will um, self-fund um, the bylaw itself and if the bylaw is determined to need that tracking system in theory the goal would be to have that self-funding of the fee structure fund any necessary it improvements to get that tracking system up and running um budgeting comes directly from the town manager to the town council the town manager proposes an operating budget proposes a capital budget the town council then holds hearings on it and votes on it that process is actually starting now um, i believe our budget hearing is in november the the first sort of hearing on what do people want to see in next year's operating and capital budgets i believe that's in november i'd have to take a little bit of time to look up what the plan is on what day that is um, but then from there, it goes to once we've had that sort of financial indicators of where we might have stuff, our finance committee, the council finance committee will discuss um, um, the financial guidelines and then the council will pass them generally and adopt them generally in late December, um, sometimes early January. After that, the manager uses those guidelines to create the budget. Um, and then the manager proposes that budget, the operating side, in May, um, and the council finance committee reviews it and 
and recommends adoption or not adoption to the council by June. And then the council votes on it in June. For capital, that prep process generally starts with the manager proposing a, a potential capital plan in February to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, at which time the Joint Capital Planning Committee meets on a regular basis to make a recommendation to the manager, who then formally files his capital budget with the council in May. Um, so I hope that gave you a little bit of an overview of where those things might come from. Did that help, John? I, it was helpful. Uh, I just have one last question about, uh, for instance, if I wanted to email somebody in town to encourage them to do this, who would I, who would I send that email to? I always recommend sending that to the manager and the council. Um, so the manager's email is townmanager at amherstma.gov, and the town council's email is towncouncil at amherstma.gov. Thank you. You're welcome. Ira, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Ira Brick, I would just like to suggest that you add one more um type of housing to the exemptions and that would be uh, you have a dorm owned by a university i would add a dorm owned in a public private partnership with a university and it could be a little incentive of another way that an outside investor instead of buying a block of homes and ruining the neighborhood um, that they might approach the state and just build an apartment on campus with all the amenities that students want and some of the amenities that they claim that they get off campus like a place to study if that's so um you know it could just inadvertently bring in a developer who's going to build more dorms on campus thank you for that recommendation ira um to add a little clarifying or some information our current bylaw exempts dorms owned by institutions of higher education the three in town they don't have to be operated by them. So what we've been informed as a CRC is that the new dorms going in through the public-private partnership near Lincoln Avenue on Mass Ave um, would be exempt from this bylaw because the underlying land is and underlying building is owned with that agreement is owned by the University of Massachusetts, even though they will be operated by a third party. That may not be how every public private partnership works. And so your comment is certainly worth digging into a little more as we look at those exemptions. But um, the current one that we're aware of would be exempt from this bylaw from what we've been informed. I don't see any other hands. What I want to do is give the opportunity for CRC members if they have any questions they would like to pose to our attendees right now to see if any of the attendees want to respond to those questions. If they're wondering about and would like some specific feedback on anything that that we've been discussing in CRC while we've got this opportunity with people here, I want to give our committee the opportunity to ask those questions to see if there's anyone in the audience that would like to respond to them. So I'll give, I know I'm throwing that on you right now without any thought, and I apologize for that, but it just occurred to me that we should take this opportunity if there are any questions, like what Pam asked earlier about how could we do stuff um, best positioned to provide some control over the tenants. If there's any questions like that that we'd like to put out there, I'll, I'll wait a couple of minutes to see if anyone has questions they'd like to pose um, to the audience members themselves. And then in the meantime, if the attendees would like to have any other comments or questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, if we get none of that in the next couple minutes, I will be looking to adjourn the meeting, but I'm going to hold it out open just a little bit longer to make sure we've allowed the chance for everyone who would like to speak to speak. So while the committee is thinking, um, Janet McGowan, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Thank you. Um, thank you again. Um, I want to commend the CRC for taking on this incredibly complicated and really important issue to Amherst. Um, you know, it's my experience both in and outside of um, town government and just listening to um, 
friends and residents who live in neighborhoods with a lot more um, rental housing than I do, although we have a fair amount, it's no one has really been addressing the fact that Amherst is a small college town and has college town problems. And I see this as a great effort, a great start on trying to um, get a handle on these things. You know, my experience is that uh, renters are paying really high rents for poorly, many, not all of them, but many are paying high rents in poorly maintained properties. I've been inside the houses and uh, units of my children's friends and been aghast. And also they're paying really high rents. And, you know, I, I assume the same is true, um, you know, at other, you know, for, for other renters also. And with when you have such a tight rental market, people don't have a lot of options. Students, I don't think, know their rights, and there's no other place to go. And so the town, I think, needs to step in and create, you know, good standards to enforce them, you know, to make calmer communities, but also just to help the renters live in apartments that don't have dripping water under the sink or bathrooms that don't work or, you know, bad flooring or, I mean, just, you know, I, I, it just, you know, you have to see sort of student housing, poor quality student housing to really believe it. And it's not just a problem in Amherst. My my son's law school town, when he, I couldn't believe what his summer sublet was like. I just was aghast. And so I think you're doing a good job to try to help renters and also the neighborhoods that they're in. And so I, I do I do appreciate it. I know it's complicated and I know you're putting burdens on landlords. And as a landlord myself, I know business people don't sit around and say, I'd like some more regulations. I really want to pay some more fees, but I actually think that's just part of the deal. And these are not heavy fees for what in a town with some really extremely high rents, you know, some of the rents are higher than Boston rents. So I just appreciate the effort. I know it's complicated. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for those kind words, Janet. Um, Hilda Greenbaum, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road. Um, since 1959, my husband and I, PFC began in 59, I joined, restoring old houses that otherwise would have been torn down, mostly historic houses, and taking things that have really been in very poor condition. Other people would have torn down and replaced them, but they had enough aesthetic value to say. I have turned around several neighborhoods and I have lived here for over 60 years. I think people know me. Um, there are things that really bother me terribly about this. The problem is the single family homes in neighborhoods. Every single one of the rest of us is controlled. Anything bigger than a single family home is controlled by a permit from the zoning board or more recently, I think planning board is giving permits at least to the larger units. I, maybe some of the two family also if they're owner occupied. But anyway, those permits are supposed to be enforceable. The conditions on them are supposed to be enforceable. The problem is the single family homes and neighborhoods. I suggest that instead of rewriting all the state, local, and federal laws, you concentrate on the problem. And I think each one has to be solved neighborhood by neighborhood. And I've noticed in the latest zoning by zoning uh, permits for Fearing Street and a few others, um, Pine Street that came after that, neighbors, and landlords and tenants knocked heads together to great success solving the problem within the neighborhood. And I think that what has to happen is you start enforcing the bylaws that we have state, federal and local. Don't charge every tenant a town. I don't even know what your student is. You're talking about students. I am surrounded by rental housing of adults who have lived here for 20, 25 years. I never see them, they're very quiet. I have one owner occupied house that abuts me. I never see them. They are not problems. They shouldn't have to pay for this. If in fact it's a town problem, it should be paid for out of the tax rate. If you're dreaming, if you don't believe that these, all of these increases, added on to the $500 I have to pay the bid, which doesn't even plow my sidewalk, but I do get a pot of flowers to um, decorate the 
bus stop right in front of my house. I get that, but it cost me $500 on top of what you want to charge me the same thing for a graduate student occupied studio as a four bedroom slum in a neighborhood. It's not fair. I think the people with the problem should be paying for the inspections and for the multiple inspections. Don't charge everybody else who, who's quiet and are not bothering the neighborhoods. I think you need to find a way of solving the small problem. Rob Moore knows who they are. John Thompson knows it. We've known who they are for 15 years. And it is getting worse, yes. But hopefully with the raising mortgage rates now getting up to above, you know, six, seven percent, it might slow some of that down. But um, I, I think you're going way overboard, rewriting all the laws that are already on the books, which have not been enforced. And if you need more money, take it out of the tax rate. You, the tenants obviously would be owning their own houses if they could afford it. Families would be owning their own houses if they could afford it. Don't make the rents higher because all of these fees, believe it or not, are going to get passed on in higher rents. Find a way to solve the problem without invoking unintended consequences that we can't even think of at the moment that could happen. But first of all, I, I don't know how you're gonna decide if somebody buys a house, if he's renting it to students or he's renting it to four adults who happen to be 22 and they're grad students or they're older undergraduates, army vets coming back from the war, going to school, they're students. So, so you've got to figure that one out because otherwise you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. The other whole th thing that I, I picked up listening to the lawyer for the fearing sunset complex is you may take a student to court, but what happens if that student is one of the protected minorities? He may be a student, but he's going to sue you because he's a protected minority under one of the categories that the law protected. And, and so, so where are you going to be after that? You'll end up in a court case that drags on for years and years and years, and you haven't solved the problem of a noisy tenant in a neighborhood. So I think you have to figure out a way of neighborhoods making neighborhood associations like Amherst Hills and Echo Hill and, and um, Amherst Woods all have neighborhood associations which control what happens to houses there and solve it within the neighborhood with the problem and not impose it on all the rest of us who have been around for 50 years and are trying very hard to save, save old houses so that you're not filling up the landfills and you're not, um, you know, putting stuff in the environment that shouldn't be there, the, you know, the best use for houses and adaptive reuse and, and try to encourage things like that. Encourage, you, you're gonna catch more bees with honey, more flies with honey than you are by beating us all over the head and making me pay yet more and more and more taxes and fees on top of what already is a very high tax rate. And that's my rant for today. Thank you for your comments, Hilda. Um, Alan St. Hilaire, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, Alan St. Hilaire, Valley Property Management. I uh, just wanted to uh, speak to uh, Hilda's comments about the fees, and I think the fees in general. Um, you know, I think that something would be worth considering is tying the fees to the assessed value of the property. That is how all taxes for all services in the town are levied. And I don't see why this should be any different. You know, if you look at Puffton, for example, where there are 400 rental units versus a duplex on Main Street, um, those taxes are levied based on the assessed value of the property. And the assessor takes into account the best and highest use of that property, which may well be a rental. So that is something to consider. It's very formulaic. It's already existing. And uh, for someone to argue that it's not equitable would have to then look at how the taxes in the town for all services are levied. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for consideration. I know you haven't discussed a lot about how to do the fees. And I think a lot of the smaller landlords are, uh, are worried and concerned. And I do think that Hilda makes a good point that these are gonna get passed along. 
Um, and the, the other comment I wanted to make is that we are a small management company in town. We represent a lot of these smaller landlords that have one property, two properties. Um, and I like to think that we have a good relationship with the town officials and do a good job and, you know, control our properties. And to, to reflect what Hilda just said, you know, there are a lot of good landlords out there that take good care of their properties and are after their tenants and do drive-bys. We drive by their pro properties once a week to make sure par parking is in control. There's not litter all over the property. There's not pong tables left out in the front yard. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of landlords out there that are doing this and are doing a good job. And there are a few landlords that are not. And those are the landlords that need to be brought into compliance and gone after. I do agree there are a lot of mechanisms in place to do that already. Uh, one of the biggest is the state sanitary code. Any tenant in town student or not, can call the health department and get a thorough inspection, which then is a violation of consumer protection law, which for a landlord is one of the biggest laws out there. If you're sued under consumer protection, it's triple damages. So that is something that's already there. Uh, the town inspection officials, code inspection officials have tools at their disposal to go after these landlords that aren't doing a good job. I do, you know, Andrew DeCervo mentioned about, um, you know, landlords being responsible for things out of their control. I agree. We are careful with our tenant selection. We get good tenants. We watch over them. We respond. We get weekly police reports from the police department. We check those every week. If we have problem properties, we go after them. We talk to the tenants. We talk to the tenants' co-signers if they are applicable. So to have... Um, you know, the great majority of landlords who are doing a good job and the, the students, we, we love our students. A lot of our students are very good tenants. Most of them, in fact, we read those police reports and there's eight, 10 properties a week townwide that are a problem. And if they continue to be a problem, they should be dealt with. But to put this on all of the landlords and all of the students, you know, the students are the economic engine in our area. They're the lifeblood of our community. And uh, I think that they should be welcomed and not made to feel like they are, uh, you know, the enemy or unwanted in town. So that is what I think should be considered uh, and focused on, as opposed to broad regulations that capture, you know, the, the, the greater majority of good landlords and good tenants. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Alan. Um, Hilda, your hand is up. Is this a, a new hand? Um, or is it just lingering? Yes, my hand was up. I just wanted to make one comment. The buildings like, like uh, Puffton Village are not the problem. They are inspected inside out by lots of agencies that fund the, the, the rents of the tenants. But also I have to point out that the insurance companies are even more rigorous in inspecting the houses than even the, the sanitary code because they're scared to death of insuring houses with undergraduates in it. So any repairs I've had to make over my over the years with what happened to be the steps at 351 Main Street, I think was done because it was required by the insurance company, not by the town. And so I, I again, I wanna reiterate that the rest of us endure already lots of inspections and that it, we are not the problem. It's the single family homes out there that, that number one may not know all of these laws. I had to go to school to learn them. And that was generally done by the forerunners, I guess, of the, of the Valley Development people had to have, that managed a lot of tenants, had a, a landlord representative who taught us what all the rules were 30 and 40 years ago. So again, places like Puffin should not be subsidizing the, the, the problems that are related to single family homes and neighborhoods because Puffton Village and the large complexes are not a problem. They are already heavily regulated, state, federal, and local. And that's the end of my second rant. Thank you for your comments, Hilda. Um, Riva Novi, please um, unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, I'm Riva Novi. Um, I live at 24 Northeast Street. Um, I, I don't believe that um, 
blanketly charging everyone the same amount is a good idea, especially a landlord or an owner who has only one or two properties, possibly tying it into um, the valuation of the property as was just suggested might be a good solution, but surely there should be something graduated. There's really a huge difference between um, a person who owns one or two properties and a person who owns 10 or 12 or 15 properties. And uh, even the jump from $100 to $250, that was a pretty big shock. It's not that I can't afford it, it's just that I consider myself a responsible landlord. Um, I'm very picky about who my tenants are. And just as an overall comment, over the years of owning this property, and renting it out. I've had undergraduate students, I've had graduate students, I've had couples, I've had families. And I have to tell you, the worst tenants I ever had happened to be a family. So, and some of the best students I've ever had happened to be a group of undergraduates. But I think educating landlords about how they should be interviewing for their tenants is something that you should consider. And I do appreciate that this committee is trying um, to make some standards that will apply to everybody. I have been in some rental properties when we were considering a purchase. They were appalling the condition that some of those landlords allowed their properties to be in. And um, I just think that, you know, as a person who owns two rental properties total at this point, one, because we're living in the other one, um, I, I think that something needs to be put in place so that it's not that much of an economic burden. Um, I do think that the higher you make the fee, the more that landlord is probably going to pass it on to their tenants. And so there should be some kind of graduated um, fee schedule, depending on how many properties you own. And I do think actually having an inspection with a specific list is probably a very good idea. So I think there is a part to educate landlords in choosing their tenants. And I think there's a part about educating tenants on, on their responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Riva. Um, Mary Sayer, please um, mute your, unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment or question, or ask your question. Hi, um, Mary Sayer, I live on Pine Street in the Pine Street co-housing. Um, and unfortunately, I came in on this late because I was looking at the Amherst Media thing, not realizing it wasn't this, or I, anyway. So I came in late, but um, uh, I just want to say that what Hilda says and the other two people make a lot of sense to me. Um, I inherited my mother's house and I've rented it because I, I didn't want to let it go. And um, I have wonderful tenants. Um, and my, I guess my feeling is too that I'm, uh, my money is going into making that a really good um, sustainable house with super insulation and good heating and so I, I get you know it's hard to be penalized because I'm doing that and and um, I think the somehow going through inspections really makes a lot of sense there was a one of my daughters lives in the Harlow Drive area and um, a little house came up well, it's very clear that that house should be inspected. We, we talked to the students there and there are six students living in that house. The, there's no parking plan, obviously, because there's enough space for two cars and there's up to six cars there. So all a town inspector has to do is drive by that place. And there's, you know, there's, there's trash, there's a pile of trash by the, the um, garage. And I'm just feeling there's so many houses. There was one house on Pine Street down near the center, which looked to me as though it probably had knob and tube wiring. And um, I would be terrified to have my children live in a place like that because it looks like a, a fire trap. And I just feel there needs to be some way to inspect these places and make the landlords follow the rules that are already in place. Um, and, and say to students, we like having you here. You're in a neighborhood and you are a neighbor. And you know, 
I, uh, anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> thank you for your comments, Mary. Um, Lily Bruce, please unmute yourself, state your name where you live and make your comment or ask your question. Hi, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. Um, my name is Lily Bruce. I'm a UMass student and I'm on the, the, I'm a representative of the Student Government Association. And so I just wanted to come and share com some concerns that we have um, just because I feel as though this might um, stray some landlords for, from wanting to rent out their properties to students because if they have this, like if they think that students are just gonna cause problems, then um, that might be an issue like they don't want to have to like deal with that and stuff like that um and so housing is a like really big problem with students like i know right now um i've been trying to look for housing and the leases are very very high and there's not much available for students so i just don't want um this to become something that landlords where landlords don't want to rent out to students anymore because then we won't have a lot of options available for us and we need options because there's already not enough housing on campus for us already. So I just don't want this to become a bigger problem, anything like that, but thank you. Thank you for coming, Lily, and thank you for your comments. To my committee on fellow committee members on CRC, are there any questions you would like to pose to the audience? Shalini. Um, so one of the things that I noticed from the survey was that there were three situations in which there were good relationships between um, landlords and tenants, whether they were students or, you know, long term um, tenants. And so one was where they were living with the landlords. The second was even the downtown buildings. Actually, they said the maintenance was really good. The big, the newer buildings where there's very professional management. And, and then the third people mentioned where the neighbors reached out and they invited and included the tenants into their, um, they create, you know, into their parties or um, potlucks and picnics. And so there was an effort made to um, include the tenants. And that's one of the things that also came up was that tenants felt they were not included in the town emails and uh, newsletters. But so I think there's room over there. And that might be a question for if there's anyone in the audience that has successfully engaged with um, tenants and what are ways that you're able to build those uh, mutually respectful relationships uh, with tenants. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Reva Novi, please unmute yourself and make your comment. I'll respond to Reva Novi, 24 Northeast Street. Um, I've owned my townhouse here since 2003 when my daughter was a student and ended up in a dangerous housing situation at which we told her to immediately leave and go to a hotel. As it worked out, we had been contemplating buying a place. That's the townhouse that we currently own and we're actually living in it now. So what we've done, once our daughter went off on her own, bought her own house, we've used this as a rental until my husband retired. And, um, and now we're here contemplating living here full time. Um, what we have done is when we have, we have our daughter, when we weren't living here, show our property, or we had our current tenants showing our property. Our current tenants, because we weren't there, could say whatever they wanted to those prospective tenants. Also, after the prospective tenants left, our tenants told us what they thought of these prospective tenants. So there are lots of people that we just, you know, did were not interested in because of the feedback we got from our current tenants. We've always had good relationships. When we, when we weren't living here, we would still come to town several times a year. We would take our tenants out for breakfast or out for a beer, depending on what the storyline was. And we always had good lines of communication. Every month, our tenants needed to email us or when they used to pay by check, then 
they would have to enclose a little piece of paper that said that they tested the fire alarms, they looked at the fire extinguishers to make sure they were still full, and that they had changed the furnace filter that we provided. So we've always gotten along and fostered a relationship. And our um, townhouse is part of 10 townhouses. We made sure the neighbors next door knew who they were and that the trustees for this little development also knew who they were. We have literally never had a problem with any of the tenants that we've had in this particular property. And like I said, we have owned this from 2003 when our daughter was living here as an undergraduate. And um, we do own another property in town and we, we've actually had the same tenant. We've only owned it for a few years, but we also have a good relationship with her, email back and forth. When we're in town, we always go and visit. Now that we've been here for several months, we drive by that property at least once a week. So um, I think that the things that were said is you, the, as I said before, I think that loan artists have to be very particular about who their tenants are. And I also think you do have to foster a good relationship because it also helps and makes your tenants think, you know what, I have a really good landlord. I need to treat this property really well. Now, I must admit that our property is kept in very good condition also, but I think it's a, it's a relationship that you build. Thank you for your comments and observations, Reva. Um, Dorothy Pam, please unmute yourself and make your comment. Hi, I live at 229 Amity Street. And in our district, the old precinct 10, we have a monthly neighborhood brunch which has been going for over 20 years, rain or shine, snow or whatever. Um, and we've always invite the students who live on our street or live in the houses that uh, of, of our members. There are a lot of students living amongst us here. But the problem that's happening is if a street no longer has quote unquote non-students or you know doesn't have uh, families in them anymore, and a street becomes nothing but student rentals. That street, we can't we can't reach out, we can't do anything, and that street gets out of control. And that is what's happening on some of the streets on the edges of the neighborhood. So I think there was some talk at some point um, about doing something uh, as they do in um, some other college towns, of saying that there can only be so many of them on a street or so many within so many feet, because where we have our students integrated in the neighborhood, we have no problems at all. But when a street no longer has families renting it and it's just a series of student rentals, the whole thing falls apart. So that's something I'm hoping from, from this. Um, you know, and of course we, we joke about how everybody wants to have a student because many of, many of the students who, who live uh, you know, in owner-occupied rentals um, are in fact wonderful at helping with computer problems for their um, slightly older um, landlords. Um, so we all want one. So it's just, we just need to keep a decent, uh, a mixture, a balance in the neighborhoods between the owner occupied houses and the student rentals. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for your comments. Mary Sayer, please unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Um, hi, I guess what I, the recurring theme I hear is that um, the houses that are owned, this is what Hilda was saying, but others have said too, that the houses that are owned by mostly people who live in town and two don't have a bunch of properties are fine. The students are fine. They're integrated in the neighborhoods. It's, the, it's, it's over and over the LLCs that are buying up these properties and really don't care. And the house that, that I was talking about on Harlow Drive it's, it's, you know, it needs painting. Um, it's, it, it just looks really unattractive outside. So I can imagine six students living in that house. What would be the incentive to mow the lawn or make it look nice or anything? And so to me, it's, it's this investment with, the, with all these LLCs that, um, I don't know, it's how you, I, I, I think Pam, Dorothy Pam had an interesting thought but it feels a lot like that's where inspection services should be um, pointing their headlamps because 
as, as, as landlords who only own one or two properties and are citizens of the town, I know I'm invested in this town, but somebody, an LLC from Oregon is not invested in this town. So I'd really like somehow concentrating on how we can, you know, if you own X number of properties or you're not a, a resident, I don't know, but um, I, I think a lot, I think that it's not students per se are not the problem. I, I honestly think that mostly it's the landlords and the LLCs that are, are you know, making this a, a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your comments. I see no other hands from, oh, Shalini. I did have one more question and I don't know, Will. Tom Cressman has his hand up, so should we wait? To hear from him but i did have a question for the audience regarding and i don't know if anyone is willing to answer that but that is something we wondered whether homes are rented per bedroom or per house and i don't know if anyone wants to answer that and maybe it's both but that was my question thank you thank you for that question and jennifer we'll have you speak and then we'll see um we got a lot of hands coming up. So after Jennifer, we'll get all the questions out and then people can respond to whatever they'd like to. Jennifer. Um, yes, I did just want to pick up on, you know, what Chalini said, um, you know, what we mean per bedroom is, would you charge the same for, is it perhaps, would you charge the same for three tenants as four or four tenants as six? But I just wanted, I was really um, encouraged when I heard, I think it was Rena Nove and um, Mr. St. Hilaire, that particularly Mr. St. Hilaire, because it sounds like you're with a management company that manages a number of properties, that you actually do go by the, the houses, like on Mondays, and make sure kind of the litter from the weekend is picked up. Because you know I live in the, um, represent the same uh, district as Dorothy, and we live in the same precinct where there's many, you know, um, Many houses rented to families, students, everybody. But there are, like I'm thinking of one, two family, two units side by side, a block away from me. Eight students have lived there for years. It is immaculate. And I see the um, property owner lives in Amherst and comes regularly, you know, and, and takes very good care of that property. And then there's other houses where the beer cans from the weekend, I mean, I see the same, they're there two weeks later. And I just wonder, you know, why the, it's, I, these are usually management companies don't come regularly and just, it's wouldn't take that much time and effort, just pick up the beer cans. So I was interested in how um, Mr. Uh, St. Hilaire, um, how they handle this, if they really do just, you know, do you retain someone that just visits the properties? Because that would go a long way towards, um, you know, uh, you know, some of these houses living harmoniously um, with the community. Because most do, but some are just problematic. And I, I, I um, hold the, you know, would look to the the management company or the property owner more than the, the tenants living there. And I think that's where. I would say that yes, the landlords have a responsibility in in terms of the tenants. Um, you know, and it it doesn't seem to take that much effort to just make sure that litter is picked up from the front lawn and the sidewalks in front of the house. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. We're going to move to the attendees. We are down to twenty one attendees. In case people were curious, um, Tom Crossman, please unmute yourself and make your comment. Um, yeah. Hi, um, hello everyone. Uh, Tom Crossman, Amherst native. Um, I uh, grew up in the community. Uh, quick process would be I, I grew up in a single family house. I lived in foster care. I lived in subsidized housing. I lived in multifamily housing. And that was by the time I was 12 years old. So I, I was exposed to a lot of different things in the community. Um, most of my time was spent in Amherst and Amherst offers a lot. Um, I am, uh, I do kind of miss the the vibrancy of the family communities for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that the university being the flagship school of the state of Massachusetts is going to continue to get uh, funding for more and more education. So we have to embrace the fact that that that's our number one industry is academia. 
and so I what I try to think of is, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to unload three hours worth of thoughts into four minutes or less. But um, um, I think that right now, there's a couple of things that that pop into my head. Uh, one of the things I've heard in the past is that uh, the many are paying for the sins of the few. Um, I'm also curious about data because I, I'm pretty data driven. I, I love numbers. And I'm curious, is anyone collecting data to see um, what the inspection services were like up to 2013 prior to the implementation of the safe and healthy neighborhoods? What inspection services volume was like after 2013? Um, and then what it was like in recent years to see if there has been um, an uptick all over again, if there was um, a downtrend, an uptrend, or stable. I'm, I'm real curious if anyone's collecting data um, and and to see if that is taken into consideration. And then, uh, yeah, that, that I'll wrap it up there. I have another 107 ideas, but I'll just let that be what it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tom, for those comments and for you and anyone else that has a ton of ideas that would like to be in front of CRC, feel free to email. The easiest one I'm going to say is the whole town council because that's just one address and that is towncouncil at amherstma.gov. It will come to all 13 councilors, which means it will make it to all five members of the CRC. Um, before I recognize Hilda, Pat. No, I was just going to say it, it's getting late for me and uh, but these are important issues, but I'd rather go to someone who hasn't spoken yet. And I believe that's Freddie Manning. Um, and there may be the people who have spoken several times, I'm uh, wondering if they could email us their comments. Thank you for pointing that out. So we will um, speak with, we'll recognize Freddie Manning first, because I did say I would try to recognize the people that haven't spoken before those that have. So Freddie Manning, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Hi, Freddie Manning, Winifred Manning. I live on the corner of Fearing Street and Nutting Avenue. I've lived here for 50 years. I have seen about all the action that any of you can possibly imagine with students and all. I think um, that I, what I would hope for is some kind of consistent inspections. I know that you know there's all the LLCs that each one can be like a separate entity and so they don't get lumped together and there's there's some very responsible ones, but there's larger groups. I also was not here at the beginning of your meeting, so I may be repeating a whole lot of stuff that other people have said. But I, there just has to be something done about being responsible for what's going on at at these at the properties because we have you know close down like down on we're right on the edge by the university, and and by, down on Phillips Street there's only one permanent resident down there. And so they are very heavily effect, affected by the partying that goes on. And we all, you know, I'm not gonna go on about that because um, you've all heard those stories. But I think that the inspection services that are consistent and have set rules would make a big difference. And I don't think that there's been very much, in, I think inspections have had to be, according to what I've heard, is that inspections have to be triggered by something that uh, rather than having it be a, a consistent, regular kind of thing. So maybe that's something that would make a difference. It's a great, great neighborhood. And I love the action of students and, and the liveliness of students and all that, but it does turn dark and sometimes it's not so nice. But, so thank you. Thank you for your comments, Freddie. And I'll just respond a little bit with saying the current bylaw is a in complaint-driven inspection system. The um, To get the permit, the owners do a self-inspection. They certify a self-inspection. And our building commissioner and inspectors only go in a property if there's been a complaint in general. That is a, a generalization in general. Um, the proposal that we're working on would have every rental parcel inspected generally approximately every three years by our town officials. Um, and so it would move from a complaint driven inspection basis to a permit driven inspection basis. 
Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions as to where we're trying to go with this. Um, we've got three hands up, and if we have none after that, we're going to look to adjourn the meeting afterwards. Um, but we're going to start with Hilda. So Hilda, please unmute yourself and make your comment. I want to just answer Shalini's question very quickly. Renting by the bedroom is a disaster. It's a, it's a recipe for a very unstable living situation. If you're trying to rent a four bedroom unit or even a two bedroom unit to people who don't know each other, you're gonna have coming and going and coming and going if they don't get along. It's bad enough when you know you have a group of three that know each other very well and the third one doesn't get along with that. But, but you can't have tenants moving in and moving out three and four times during the year. It, it, it just does not work out and then if they don't get along, you're not going to get the rent and you're going, et cetera, et cetera. I will not do that. And it seems to me that the, my impression over 60 years is that those that are renting by the bedroom are renting that way because they can't get a stable group to go there and they get desperate and want to rent something at you know, don't want to leave an apartment empty at the last minute. But but basically, my son rents stuff a year, 18 months ahead, just from one tenant to the next tenant year after year. And uh, that seems to work out really well. If you've got a good place, the tenants recruit the next group to their friends. But renting room by room, not a good idea. Very bad. Thank you for those observations, Hilda. Um, Riva Novi, please unmute yourself and make your comment. I'll address the question about how we rent our townhouse. We rent it collectively to the tenants together. We do not rent it by bedroom. And um, actually our property insurance um, highly um, encourages, us, encourages us not to rent by bedrooms. So um, that's what we do. And uh, when we do have a group where everyone is not moving out at the same time, we, um, but some of the tenants want to stay if it happens to be students, I offer to help them find a new tenant but they're the ones that have to live with the person. And the few times that that's actually happened, they've always wanted to find the roommate themselves. And uh, as long as the required, long as they satisfy our requirement, a maximum of two cars and absolutely no smoking inside or outside, they have to live with them, we do it. So to address that question, we only rent a collective lease. Thank you. Before I go to Jennifer, um, and. Andrew, you just unraised your hand. Um, now you've raised it again. So Andrew, please unmute yourself and make your comment. I was waffling whether I want to talk about this or not, but um, this harkens back to, I just want to comment on what some of the bias that I've heard so far here, which is, you know, people should um, pay better attention to who they're renting to. And you know, I just want to remind people that, um, we have a set number of students. Now, maybe we can push them out to other municipalities. Maybe you can, they can rent houses in um, our neighboring towns and whatnot. But really, you're going to get what you're going to get. Sometimes you're going to get somebody or a group that's going to, it's not going to work out the way that you want them to. And I, I think some of the, th the considerations that I don't know how you would fix this, but it, a lot of times it comes down to normative behavior. I mean, this is why they had rowdy behavior in dormitories and the like, you know, I mean, when you have people acting crazy, um, at that particular, at this age group, they're going to go out there and ramp it up to go out there and stick out. And I think, you know, if you remember where I live, Northeast Street, right there by the intersection, I know there's someone else right down the street from me, but, you know, there's some crazy party houses here. And, you know, if that is what's the dictating the norm uh, for this population, uh, I'm swimming upstream sometimes. And I, I think what it kind of comes down to is like, if you have four people in there and they decide that's normal, um, you're going to have a hard time. And, you know, it doesn't happen every time you have a group of people, but it's a dynamic that, you know, again, you're putting this on the landlord uh, who is supposed to have vetted this group out before. And I do that. I have them screened, um, but you are going to have these particular challenges. And it just kind of comes down to, you know, what neighborhood are you in? What, what are the surrounding environments going to be like? And you know what, what kind of agency do you have? And I mean, I don't want to go back and harp on say, I can't control my tenants. I, I can influence my tenants. Um, 
but you know what, these other factors are factors outside of my realm of influence, really, ultimately, maybe I should go out there and live in a quiet neighborhood and bring students in, but, you know, we're, we're, we're set with what we have, so my two cents, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jennifer? Yes, I just wanted to, I mean, I don't think we think that they're um, literally renting by the bedroom, just they're renting to friends. Um, but when my, I think it was Mr. Cross asked earlier, you know, he said, if we have a house with six or seven bedrooms and we can only rent to four, I mean, if that house is rented to six or seven tenants, there will be a higher charge for the whole house than if they're renting that same house to four. Isn't that correct? If anyone can answer that, um, Tom, uh, I'm going to go to Tom Crossman because Jennifer sort of addressed that question to him, and then I'll recognize you, Mary. So, Tom, please unmute um, yourself. Yeah, I mean, there there can be an, uh, a case to be made that uh, when you have a larger house, you have larger um, uh, responsibilities for the thermal envelope as well as the shell uh, insulation, and so yes, there's going to, and in addition to that, with uh, more uh, bedrooms, you'll have more wear and tear on the property. You'll have wa more water usage, more sewer usage. So um, yes, you're right. If, if there's uh, more bedrooms and you rent to more people, then yes, there would be uh, a higher rent. That's, that's correct. There would also be um, higher expenses that are associated with that. So uh, yes, I, I agree that there would be a higher rent. And at the same time, uh, from the perspective of uh, property manager slash landlord, um, you know, we take into consideration the people we hire and their expense and the cost of supplies. And so, yes, rents are going up to, to keep up with inflation. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very challenging balance uh, managing resources in the uh, environment that we're in. And I, you know, yeah, yeah. So to answer the question, yes, more bedrooms would mean more rent uh, for that particular building. In addition, I want to uh, make sure that it's considered that there would be also more expenses to that particular arrangement. Yes, I'm not. Um, yeah, Thank that you, makes, would make sense. Um, I just that uh, it it yeah, it certainly becomes oh. a you know a, um, you can make more money from a larger house than a smaller house. It's not that student more students will get to split the same rent, but you know that uh, makes yes. sense. And then, yeah, so just, just to answer the question that, yeah, so joint and several is usually a more favorable um, uh, 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 avenue to navigate where everybody is responsible for the uh, health and well-being of the house. So they're, they're responsible joint and several. Um, whereas you may see an example like 116 Flats that tries to rent individual rooms. That's a business model that may work really well. Um, outside of the state of Massachusetts, there, that's a company from Texas that's that built a, a complex in Sunderland. Um, but I think uh, Massachusetts, being an attorney state with uh, with a lot of um, kind of laws geared towards uh, uh, protecting the tenants, which which is fine. Um, but yeah, so renting joint and several tends to be a preferred method for people who rent properties, which joint and several, for those who don't know, just means that everybody is responsible equally for the rent and the well-being of the house. Thank you, Tom. Mary Sayer, please unmute yourself and make your comment. Um, just quickly to answer the question, I rent my mother's house out as just a house. I don't rent it. Um, it's um, I've, I've, I've had two families, so um that hasn't been up but i also know and this is maybe a misinterpretation of what you're saying about bedrooms but i know i've spoken to a north amherst landlord who says i can get a thousand dollars a bedroom if i rent my houses so i can rent basically a small bungalow with four small bedrooms for four thousand dollars now that's a problem because a family couldn't probably afford four thousand dollars for a small bungalow with three four tiny bedrooms and my guess is like my mother's house has two bedrooms a study and a, and a basement that's made to be livable so I could call it a four bedroom house and rent you know a thousand dollars a bedroom that's nowhere near what I charge for a family to rent my house so there is a thing with some landlords that they rent in their head anyway by the bedroom. So when these landlords are looking at Harlow Drive and those places, they look at a little ranch house and they say, wow, 
you know, I can make four bedrooms out of this and I can get $4,000. So I don't think that's actually what your question was, but I think it's a real problem. They do rent in a way by the bedroom. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Mary, and your experience. Um, Hilda Greenbaum, please unmute yourself and make your comment. Very quickly, I wanted to point out renting by the bedroom where the tenants don't know each other would be covered under a different section of the bylaw, which is rooming house. And that comes under a different kind of a permit. And the regulations are quite different. And I think it requires a live-in manager also, depending on whether they're under three rooms or whether there are six rooms. But anyway, rent that, that would invoke the the boarding house, rooming house bylaw, which is very different and you really ought to know that that exists. So the, the again, the renting to the group as a whole is the way to go if you wanna be under this section of the bylaw. Thank you for that, Hilda. Um, it is now 9.20, I see no other hands. Um, and so unless I get other hands from CRC members in the next about 10 seconds, um, I'm going to adjourn our meeting. With that, I want to thank um, Rob Mora for taking the time out to be here in case there were any questions for him as building commissioner. I wanna take this thank you to my fellow CRC members and also Michelle Miller who had to leave at some point. Um, for coming here and listening. And I want to thank everyone who, from the public who attended. Um, we have, as I said, a maximum of about 40 some people here um, listening, but also commenting and giving us their input. And I know for myself, it's given me a lot to think about as we go on and continue these discussions. So thank you all to having come um, and given us your thoughts and your input. Um, and feel free to continue following us and continue sending us your input as these drafts change and as we move on into the regulations. Our original goal was to have something to the council by December. I haven't formally told my committee this yet, but I've told some of them in private, which is I don't think we're making that deadline because there's a lot still to do. Um, and so, you know, we'll we'll make a report to the council as required by December, but I'm not sure we're not going to have a formal proposal to the council by December because there's just a lot more to talk about and, and we want to get it right before we bring it to the council. Um, so with that, um, thank you all. I'm adjourning the meeting at 922 p.m. Have a nice night. Thank you, everyone.